Well, why don't we start with Charles Mingus, probably has written uh, over 300, Sue, 300 compositions yeah. with so many different styles. I mean, everything from head solo head to gospel, as Ken, Ken was saying, gospel, free music, uh, film music. He did John Cassavetes uh, film, uh, was it? Uh, yeah. Shadows. The Shadows, right. Um, maybe you talk a little bit about that, uh, the various, uh, uh, various styles. Uh, well, that's a, that's, a, that's a big point about right. Mingus amongst, I mean, there's only other, one other who equals him in the productivity, and that's elegant because he wrote 2,000 pieces, but mostly they were small, miniature pieces, because in those days, any composition had to be only three minutes long. Right. By the time Mingus came around, you know, the LP had been invented and everything, so he, he wrote a lot of long pieces, of course, uh, the most fantastic of the Mahler's epitaph, which we maybe ought to talk about a little bit. But yes, and, and what you were saying, and I, it, I don't know of any composer in jazz of such wide-ranging stylistic, uh, harmonic, rhythmic invention. And it, it goes all the way from the the most soulful, beautiful, simple music to the most extremely chaotic, uh, powerful music. I mean, and poetic in between. I mean, it, it, and he was that way in, in, in his talking, too. He was a very, he, he, he acted very extremely. I mean, we all know he could knock people's teeth out. And then the next day, you know, he could give you a big kiss. You know, he never knocked mine out. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I uh, before, before I all got involved with Mingus's music, um, which was what, what's this now, 80, 1988, when we did Epitaph. 89. 89, yeah. Yeah, before that, uh, Charlie and John Lewis, my co-worker in Third Stream Ideas and all of that, working with the Modern Jazz Quartet and with Miles Davis and so on. Um, the three of us met rather regularly for about two or three years in the Carnegie Tavern. He just reminded me of it. Um, and uh, which, which was a fantastic restaurant. And, uh, and of course we talked about music and we argued about a lot of things. But it was all uh, quite uh, intelligent, high level, and and also we talked about about everything else in the universe, whether it's women or politics or, or any you know anything you could think of, and and I say that only because again his brain, his mind was so wide ranging and so full of knowledge, which got expressed in some sudden outbursts sometimes not very pleasant, mm -hmm. and sometimes very gentle and poetic. I mean, just think of the titles alone. Think of Mingus's titles. They're all poetry of some kind. Or, yeah. They may be very funny or they be whatever, you know? So, I mean, I, that mind just went the complete circle. When you were meeting at the tavern, was that like kind of the beginning of what you coined the third stream? Oh, no, 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 no. that had started long before that. That was before? No, that. but, but and, and, and I first became, I had heard of Mingus, uh, I, in fact I saw Mingus when he was playing with Lionel Hampton, when he was one of the two bass players, but I didn't meet him, I didn't have the, the guts to go up to musicians and introduce myself, I was too shy about that. But then, then I, what happened, what, what really knocked me out was that I heard on the radio, Pisicantor vs. Erectus. Hmm. And that was the first great piece that, that he, he wrote some other great pieces, but we didn't know about them. They hadn't been performed, they hadn't been finished, or whatever it was. But this was, boy, I was, because that again, in terms of the, you can't even give that piece a label. Hmm. Okay, maybe you can call it searching because it, it has certain kind of a, 
almost classical form in the way it develops. Uh, but you know the the language and and the, the notes and and of course it, it eventually existed in several forms. But the original Atlantic recording and then the title. I mean, here we go again. <laughs> and and I said I I got, I got to know this man and and so then through uh, Max Roche. I, I, by that time, I knew everybody in, in, the, in the jazz field. I say that in all of humility. But, uh, and so, and Magus, who we already knew could be a quite contentious person, we uh, uh, somehow, John and I, I don't know how we all hooked up because it shouldn't have been that way. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, I'm this intellectual 12-tone composer, you know, and there's a wild man Mingus, and there's John Lewis with the pretty sound. <laughs> but there we were, and we had a ball. Yeah. But that was not, no, I, I had started long yeah. before that. Yeah. You know, Ken was talking about like extended forms, you know, Mingus written extended yeah. forms. Um, and I was thinking about when he was talking, he did a great thing about that. And I was thinking about how Mingus, it, it, and, and many of us, are not so so aware of you know obviously in jazz the solo had solo thing but there's also textural improvisation and and structural improvisation and and a lot of people are not aware of this you know yeah. even even pretty heavy jazz musician and I mean it's really kind of like started that thing it's, you know I remember when I first started rehearsing Mingus music back in I mean, I, I started rehearsing this music in 1973 with high school kids. Oh, wow. No, that's all right. You didn't know that. <laughs> it's like a long time ago. And, and I, that's when I really I started realizing yeah. that. You know, as Ken was, was talking about these. Yeah. But, but um, well, so he, maybe, maybe, maybe you can talk well, about Well, I mean, he, he said it already because he did not leave pieces just sit one way. They, right. And, of course, um, he also got so upset with some of the players sometimes that, that that led to some kind of a change of things. And he dictated and, and you know, yeah. conduct, was conduct with his mouth, yeah. <laughs> mostly yelling. And I saw him often at Birdland that way. Yeah, no, that, that and, and there is this wonderful expansiveness, not only in, in the length of the pieces and the height of the pieces and the depth yeah. of the pieces, but then this changeability, and it can be played many different ways. Right. What I find fascinating, though, is that up till like Ming is like, kind of initiating these kind of things, people were, you know, like head solo head kind of ideas. Yeah. You know, he well, was the first talking about image, images and, and you know that, that kind of thing. Yeah. And then of course Miles Miles Davis took it in the modern thing with that sextet, you know, of the the of the sixties, you know, with Herbie and Wayne and all that, and they incorporate, but it was those same ideas, at, at least the way I see it, that that, uh, that Mingus initiated. And of course Wayne Short is doing that today. Wayne has a new album that just came out that I just heard recently, I but without a net, and it's like, you know, they're taking that you know the it's a little hard started. to say who did I understand but, that. I'm just saying like, you know, that but 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 you see the thing is that Mingus wanted to be a bass player in the Los Angeles Philharmonic. Yep. He knew classical music. He knew a lot of I I'm quite sure he even heard some Schoenberg and Stravinsky. I, 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 it, it's got to be. Which, which he eventually brought, because there are Stravinsky movements, sort of, and even more Stravinsky in Epitaph. There's atonality, there's all this, I mean, he, he was aware of that, and those early pieces, what's that one piece? Chilled where up. That came in several versions, one was with a with Chilled speaking. Up. Chilled up. Yeah, yeah, that was, we think, composed in 39? Yep. Yeah. He was 17, right. yeah. Pardon? Yeah. Yeah, and he, he was, was 17. 17. And by the way, the piece uh, Mingus Fingers that he wrote yeah, for Mingus Fingers, I was thinking of that. That's a funny little weird piece. But that was with Red Norval? No, Hampton. Hampton, right, right. And Hampton, 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 Hampton didn't like it. Hampton, they recorded it. Yeah. Hampton, yeah, he recorded it, but he didn't like it, and they didn't yeah. play it for a long time. <laughs> this gentleman has a question. You, you just said something uh, that I'm, I'm sure is the answer to my question, but I want to go ahead anyway. Yeah. You said, well, it's really hard to decide who did what first. 
But you know, uh, Ming has always claimed that he was doing modal improvisation before Davis and kind of blew in 1959. Hey, you, know, you know what? I think they both started around the same time. I haven't researched it enough to be sure of that, but that's my impression. Charles uh, almost felt he never got credit for pedal point. Yeah. For his, yeah. That, that he started. Yeah, yeah, but there's, yeah. We started so yeah. many things, like changing of tempos, and I mean, rhythmic modulation, metric modulations. That modal thing, it, once it was started, it just came like a big fire immediately. It took over music. It has still taken over music. To my eyes, to, to do much of an extent, I'm more of a chromatic changes guy. I hear so many pieces on pedal points. You have to be damn good to play 17 minutes on one chord. Uh, you know. So, uh, but anyway, yes. Uh, but uh, what, if I if I had another 20 years of life, I I, I would probably find that out. That, that would take listening to a. I don't know how many, 300,000 records. Uh, Gunther, I find it fascinating. You were saying that you think that he listens to Stravinsky and Schoenberg and so forth. Did you ever talk to him about these? Well, these, these, these composers, all those ideas, you, and you're kind of, you said you were hanging like with John Lewis, the, these kind of things that would come up? It's strange that it didn't come up when we had these Carnegie Tavern meetings. Um, and. I, the only reason, I mean, I wasn't going to particularly bring it up because um, I don't know even why. And John Lewis was, of course, so much involved with studying Bach and Mozart, and he went to school. He was there. a student. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So was I, by the way. For for, but I, I wasn't enrolled. I just took horn horn lessons here, and I took one theory course, which is called keyboard harmony. But I'm not an alumnus. But, uh, and, and that was over at 105th Street and 3rd Avenue. The old building. Yeah, the old It was a settlement school. It was initiated by all the federal programs during the Depression. Yeah, it's one of those. So, uh, anyway. I, I, I have another question that just along the same lines. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we were talking about Third Street before Third Stream. Uh, didn't Charles write uh, uh, Revelations? Wasn't that part of the that original well, there was Third Stream? Well, there was, no, I commissioned that. That was you the Brandeis. The Brandeis, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. I, somebody told me, who was it, just three days ago, that somebody claimed that I arranged that. That, that, what? Did, oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I, I mean, I'm going to kill that rumor. Uh, that's totally true. No, he. She said the range of the lead sheet is in the uh, Library of Congress. And she's very. The lead sheet for Revelations is just like two pages, and it's very sketchy. So Charles himself arranged the whole thing, and there were individual parts. Charles composed yeah. every note in that piece. I have his manuscript, I conducted from it. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I, I wouldn't dare arrange. <laughs> yeah, I have your published version. I have your music published version. Well, I eventually published it. Oh, yes. But you know, no, this, this, this is again, that piece is so different from almost every other of his 299 that's pieces. Why I, that's why I'm yeah. bringing that up, exactly. And, and you know, there's classical stuff in here. My God, there's a boat solo that could be out of, uh, I don't know, uh, some classical composer, and 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 uh, and it it has uh, it has. Uh, I hope you understand what I'm going to say now. The opening, for example, is awkward to play. It's very difficult to play because the instrumentation is not the easiest to come off because of range and intonation problems on the different instruments. But you know what? <laughs> wouldn't change it for, for a second because it, 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 it is him searching for some kind of never, be heard, never before heard introduction. It's all in unison. That's one of, that's one of the problems about it. It's all in the low register, sort of growly, you know. And then, of course, there's later there's, there's the church music, the, the swing, there's, there's everything, the whole range. And wow, but me arrange that? No, I don't. Yeah. Anybody have 
Yes, come um, Yeah, I guess a question about collective improvisation. Uh, we had mentioned that that was one of the major characteristics of Charles Mingus's music, and I was I've got a number of students who are experimenting with collective improvisation. Collective improvisation. Collective improvisation, yeah. yeah. And they're doing, they're why, basing their improvisation. Why is that different? Improvisation has always been collective. Well, I, I guess we're talking about. I mean, starting in, in 1921 or somewhere. <laughs> sure, sure. I guess in the sense that we've moved away from the head solo, head form. New Orleans back to the New Orleans. <laughs> right, the early jazz of like the the <laughs> Right, so. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So the question you don't is, mean you don't mean because that's what I would have thought of. You meant free, free jazz. No, no, no. What I'm asking is the is what's the difference between Charles Mingus's collective improvisation, his approach to that, and say someone like Ornette Coleman or someone like anyone else? No, that, no. That, that, see, there, this, the great thing about Mingus, I haven't said that yet, and why he's <coughs> up in the pantheon, as far as I'm concerned, because. I'm always looking for composers. We know we have great improvisers and players, and they are composers too, but in a different way. But I'm looking for composers in the sense of the you know, early tradition. And that's the thing about Ellington and Mingus, that they compose things that are set, but that can still, still be maneuvered around. But that's not collective improvisation in my, that maybe, maybe uh, for me that wouldn't be the right, right term. Sure. So because it, 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 collective improvisation probably, depending on the players, would sort of lead to kind of almost changing the piece. I mean, you could have one player in there who, who wouldn't understand Mingus's music at all, and, and, and suddenly, you know, be something totally different and foreign to the music. No, that's the great thing about Mingus. It has this colossal freedom, and yet it has a, a thing that is set, and that, that is, is, is permanent, and, and is real composition. When, when some fine jazz improviser writes a tune, you know, a line with a bunch of changes, that's also some composing. But not when you write for instrumentations of all kinds and you write with uh, musical ideas that are of enormous complexity. Uh, they, they go beyond, I mean, the, the complexity of his music in some of the pieces in Epitaph particularly almost is a, it sounds like a collective improvisation, a huge improvisation, you know, but it's all written out. Sure, it's it's all controlled. I, I, no, I, 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 mean, I think I understand, um, but, you know, maybe we're just using a different set of vocabulary. I don't think I'm trying to say that, um, that the music is improvised, because clearly it isn't, but that there are other composers out there who, who emphasize the idea of collective improvisation and, Again, it sounds like improvisation. Say someone like yeah. Travis, Sam Rivers or, or Coleman or something like oh, that. Oh yeah, if we want to get into that, that's that's different. But I'm sure. differentiating me sure. uh, from, that's from all one the aspect. Sure. Of yeah. All the I mean, collective improvisation comes to, uh, to the fore and is part of. But there's so many other things going on. That's a, a minor part, yeah. I would sure. say. I mean, say yeah, about come to think of it, there are in some of the movements of epitaph. There, there is, in right, fact. Right? In the, in the piece where you where it all is collective improvisation yeah. at the end, like tonight at noon or whatever. But that is more part of most of Charles. No, there, there's pieces. two. two. In, there's another one. I can't think of the name. I can't remember any names at my ancient age. But there's one movement. I was just going to say there is a, a huge collective improvisation where where. 19 people oh, yeah. improvise simultaneously, but not in, uh, how, how can I uh, oh, yeah, picture no, this no, to no, you? No, no. They may play two bars, and then they don't play, and then they play another five. In the meantime, everybody has different layers and slivers of improvisation, and it goes on for about two minutes. I mean, it's the most miraculous thing I had ever seen. 19 people all improvising, all different instruments, and all on the same changes, but the way he divided this, this uh, it's like a puzzle, you know? Everybody's doing a different thing at a different time in a different range. That, that, is, uh, that was definitely collective improvisation. Sure, and, and so I guess more, more to my point, um, what is, 
what is the direction or nature of the relationship that he describes to his musicians as he's rehearsing that or as you're trying to recreate this music? You know, what direction would, would Mingus give in, in a situation like that? You know, um, there's a lot of in, the whole individual approach or there's the collective approach or there's the true to the tune or what's written. Well, kind of I don't know, in the case of that particular piece, mm -hmm. I don't think he could have said very much because it's all done on changes, on harmonies, which move sometimes four bars of a certain harmony and then suddenly only two and then three, and so it also is <coughs> moving that way. So, I mean, since he allowed the musicians to improvise, he should probably have to be satisfied with what he got. And for him even to analyze what 19 people are doing simultaneously, <laughs> I don't know about that. I can't do that. <laughs> I mean, that, it, it just creates this, this whirlwind of, of this incredible activity, which will never be the same every time it's done. That's, what, that's what's so remarkable. While the piece is still in control of how that happens. Yeah. It's amazing. Come to think of it, I, I, I already said it. I never had seen anything like that. There's another question. Just uh, historical clarification. You mentioned Revelations before, and yeah. uh, the Brandeis Festival '57. And did you say you commissioned it? Did yes, I, I was. We were been, faculty then. There. I was asked by Brandeis right. to do the first jazz concert ever at their university, and uh, they were very generous in how to approach this, and. Uh, they wanted something new. And I, by this time, knew all the composers. Um, and I decided, I made the suggestion to them that I would like to commission six pieces. And three would be by jazz composers, quote unquote, and three would be by classical composers. Forgive me if I included myself as a classical composer. But uh, the three jazzers were George Russell, um, Mingus, and uh, Jimmy, Jeff 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 Jimmy Jeff Jeffrey. And then, and then there was Milton Babbitt. My God, you know, that was, if, you know. Is that all set? Is that all set? All yes, set, yes. yes, yes. And, uh, and, and a, a, this couldn't be avoided, a, a neoclassical composer in the style of Stravinsky. Berger. Uh, 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 who wrote a piece based on Monteverdi. Uh, so, yeah, and then and that, that was done, and there were these six compositions. Yeah, it was wonderful. And then I did some other things. I did uh, Ellington's Reminiscing in Tempo on that concert, because that was the first breakthrough composition in the history of music beyond three minutes. It was 14 minutes long. And a few other things that we got in there. Yeah, that was so. Was I have a, another question going on those lines? Was was Mingus ever a part of the Lennox School when, when you were doing that? No, he wasn't. I think he may have <coughs> he was visited. I can't remember. My son George would know. He knows yeah. everything. He, he, but we didn't have him on the faculty. Okay. Yeah, I was just curious yeah. about that. Yeah. Because. John, John Lewis was a... Well, John Lewis and I created him. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. John, John did most of the cho choice. Jo John, of course, had worked with just about everybody. And I suppose he, you know, of course, some people we wanted, like Dizzy, uh, I think we had him once for two days, but he was so damn busy, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't get him at the end of time. Yeah. That was very exciting. That was a, a venture that was clearly far too far ahead of its time. Yeah. It could not survive at that time. Yeah. I mean, the idea of a school for jazz, everybody was self-taught. <laughs> what the hell? Some pretty incredible geniuses, the greatest in the history of the mankind. And suddenly we're going to teach this? This was, this was a real source. Uh, source of uh, contention with, with, with a lot of jazz people. And the classical people didn't know what was going on anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> but didn't care. 
course, that led also to summer workshops then. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, off the yeah. um, I have a, a, a fascination with epitaph, and, and I knew that, I know that you were yeah. there from the beginning. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that about when, you, when you just well, you guys discovered it and when you were working tell on the it? beginnings of it. It's, it, I mean, it, it, well, we discovered um, actually Andrew Harmsey, a musicologist at Concordia University in Montreal, um, came to visit me and discovered this trunk I had full of scattered pieces of music. And uh, he asked if he could come and organize it. Yeah. And he and his wife came several times from Montreal and he pieced together, he, he found all this music. It had measure 2053 and measure four, in the middle of all this, and different titles, Peggy's Blue Skylighter, Old, um, Chill of Death, whatever. And he pieced it all together, and this was Epitaph. It's Wait not even all of Epitaph, as we've now found out. But I called up Gunther, and he came over one night after conducting something at Carnegie Hall about 10.30. And he looked through all this, and this is what I mentioned before when Ken was talking, because he said he was speaking about Mingus music, Epitaph being Wagnerian. And I said, well, you came over and you said, this is the uh, uh, Gatterdammerung of jazz, because it was 5,000 measures. It, it weighed 15 pounds on my bathroom scale. I mean, it was 40 pounds. But it, it, it was humongous. I remember it slightly different. It comes out of the same okay. thing. <laughs> because Andrew had been cataloging trying to catalog all of his music. Oh no, this and was when it was all to, yeah. yeah. And on the last day, what, this is what I heard, he, you said to him, by the way, there's a big box in, the, in that closet over there. I don't know what's in there. Uh, take a look. And that's where this complete. No, no, no. Yeah. He, he put it, it was all separate pieces. And we found out, as a matter of fact, um, there were two or three missing pieces. There were ma and but all the pieces found, they were, were known, weren't they? They surfaced. No, some of them. Some some of them. They surfaced at the um, music library at Lincoln Center a couple of years ago. Andrew was here going and some Ellington thing, and he found these Mingus pieces. And I remember huh, this was back in the in the whenever it was early 70s, and somebody called up Charles. And they offered real money to buy a score, a thousand dollars for a score. So he went in the closet and he just plucked out three pieces from Epitaph. Whether he did it with a sense of mischief, realizing that eventually this would be found and they would add it to it. But I mean, at that point, he he called it Epitaph because he said he wrote it for his tombstone. Because he said he knew he would never get it performed in his lifetime. So he plucked out these pieces, got $1,000 for each one, and they just served. Andrew Hamsey discovered them. But this some is of those pieces were played at that time. But I mean, this is since country. you, well, right. we found one of them, which was the top half of, remember the part that just has all the rhythm section in it, um, Woods and Mom. Yeah. And it sounded very interesting, very dense. It was just all rhythm. And it, at, the library, we discovered the top half of that, and Gunther put it together, yeah, and it, I, I, it has another title yeah. now. But, but Remember? <laughs> I, what's interesting is that he, and maybe with the help of Melville Liston, she helped him a lot during that time on, on the, all those pieces, uh, at least the ones where she was active with him as a, as a, a helping in his uh, copying music and so on. Because there was the entire it's actually 4,000 something numbers. But, and, and unfortunately, there were two sets of bar numbers. Mm. That was confusing at first. <coughs> but it did turn out, it went from one to 4,192 or whatever it was. <laughs> and then we knew that this was meant to be a total piece. And then we discovered there were some pieces that were missing. In fact, we found that out years later. We didn't even record those. Now well, we we're now we think that Black Satan Sinner Lady was in fact part of that. It's on the really? same manuscript paper. But there's one. So it would now be three and a half hours instead of. <laughs> well, you can't do that. <laughs> now there's one one piece that I want to tell about because I'm very proud of of this story. Um, 
because I saved one of the pieces from never being Extinct. able to be performed. <laughs> This, this is unbelievable. Read it in my, in my notes on, on the, it, it really is, I still don't believe it when I tell all this, but what happened. This one piece, and it had no title, we gave it one. But uh, I started looking at it. I had it all, I, I, when I was studying, and, I, and nothing made sense vertically. You know, this was like 20 staff lines, you know from the horns, with the, the, the saxophones down there, all the six brass and six trumpets and all that. So a lot of things to look at. And I'm seeing on certain pages, don't make any sense. The, the harmonies weren't even coordinated. And it was this yellow, yellow paper. And then I saw that there were things that had been pasted onto certain parts of certain pages. And that didn't make any sense. And uh, respecting Mingus, and in fact all manuscripts, that I, I would never, never touch them. And it took me three weeks to decide to try and find out what is going on here and what is under those patches. <laughs> Guess what I found? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. So that, that, that really, I mean, that's, that was staggering. So this, so now, and again, I would, under, in no other circumstances do this, I decided still that I had to find out them because some things were so beautiful and so interesting uh, in every composition of respect. I said, I, there, there's something here, there, there, there is a piece here. And, what the, and again, I, I did it with great trepidation. I made a, a photostat of all the pages then I cut them all into little pieces. And wherever something, you know, the saxophone lines would suddenly go into nothing or into something totally ridiculous. And I put it all on my, and it was like 50 pieces on my floor. And so it was like a puzzle. And to make a long story short, I eventually <coughs> found that every bit of that stuff was there, but it was in the wrong place. Now the question is, how the hell did he get there? Was he drunk? Was, you know what? I mean, and, and, and I said, you know, and we play the piece now, and it's one of the most, it starts very dark with wonderfully rich harmonies and all the low instruments, and then it becomes a, a eventually a big uh, trombone solo. But it is one of the best compositions in there. And I'm so goddamn glad that I saved that. Some people, you know, accuse me of making up a story and plagiarism and all that, but that's okay. It, it was the most amazing adventure I ever had in my long research in all kinds of music, Baroque, Renaissance, classical, whatever. I, I still, I mean, how, you can't explain this. Was he cutting and pasting? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. He was just taking stuff out of different parts of the Well, uh, I, I, don't, I don't understand what you're saying. It, some things that were about, something like 11 piece, pieces of paper that were pasted onto some page, but they were in the wrong page, and then of course, they, they, and then I found out it was empty underneath anyway. So now that, that, that bit of music for him or somebody, to put that on that page four didn't make any sense because it doesn't belong on page four. Because the top of the page did this certain thing and the, and the bottom They probably of the came was, and stuck and somebody put someone else yeah, someone put them back. I mean, what was the name of that? Been, yeah. at, a, at a wild party. Yeah. He does from yeah. 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 Uh, uh, retrieving one of Mingus' compositions. Uh, do you remember this in like the, uh, the mid mid nineties or early nineties, where uh, we uh, we retrieved this piece from the uh, from Washington? Um, where does a man, does a man go, go to find peace? And where does a man go to find peace? And, and the score, the score was uh, 
was all in concert. So it was in the back of this mini sport. So uh, I just transposed the parts. You know? And uh, there were like telephone numbers on the score. <laughs> well, that, I, you know, there were a lot of those. In yeah, it. Like, like yeah, like like G E C, like you know G E five some stuff. And I just and I just like uh, I said, let me see something, man. Let me dial these telephone numbers, <laughs> right? To see if anyone picked up the phone. And there was like about seven or eight telephone numbers. And there was one guy who picked up the phone and remembered the piece uh, <laughs> that used to play with Mendes. And um, it was done for a CBS documentary oh. in the 60s. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Wow, wow, that's quite yeah. a just yeah. Yeah. That's I just want to clarify it once more. The thing that I saw on page 17 ended up correctly on page four, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> and page five ended up on page 11. What was that piece eventually called when it was performed? What the, the piece the of name of the piece of I, just, I think I just said I, my memory's No, we don't it, I, remember. I think it didn't. I didn't. It's I in didn't your notes. It it's in your notes for Epitaph. I don't remember yes. the name of I, it. We, to ballad. It, Sue and I made up a, a nice name for it. I can yeah. remember that. Who knows? We, You'll have to go on the. It was a ballad, a beautiful ballad. Yeah, that was another thing. It had no title. I'm quite sure, but but that was something weird. But you, you knew it was part of the I, epitaph because the more of the message. I looked at it, I so, felt that first of all there was some terrific music which was on pages that were okay. <laughs> that that somehow, if that's the case, why are these other pages so fucked up? <laughs> you know. So uh, I said, uh, and I thought about that for days and weeks, and and finally I said, uh, there's just something here. That, and I, I decided, you know, I bet this is a terrific piece, that there's something weird happened to it. Like went through a washing machine. He did it deliberately. Pardon? He did it deliberately, probably. Oh, no. And you that were the one that uncovered it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> do, do you, uh, uh, I'm going to address this question to, to you, to, to you guys, to Sue and Ken. Do you guys think that there's probably some music or minguses that we haven't found yet? Oh, yes. That's true of every composer. Okay. Well, We're finding that? pieces by Mozart, by Bach, every, there's some every music 10 years. That has not been found yet. Right. Well, the in the sense that Charles, as he called himself, he said other nobody else called him that, but he called himself a spontaneous composer. He wrote um, a piece for uh, liner notes for the Columbia album that my children hear music and it's called uh, What is a Composer? Or what is a Jazz Composer? Mm -hmm. And um, his mind was so fertile and so uh, yeah. constantly creating and he would sit at the piano all day long and it, it was like a, a where he found his peace and his truth and escape from all the horrors of the world. And um, I don't know if you've ever heard a piano album, but Charles did an improvisatory yeah. piano. It's called Mingus Plays Piano. Yeah. yeah the first piece on that, yeah, I know that. Um, a 60 piece orchestra yeah. um, orchestrated that. Impro a piece that was improvised into a piano, into an, an incredible composition. I mean, completely structured, completely thought I'd call myself when I'm real, with, I don't know, six movements or whatever. In fact, the big band or the orchestra plays on it. So, we, I have, to, at a certain point, uh, because Charles, as I say, had all these ideas all the time, I put a, a ta I started tape recording. I just left a tape recorder on the piano when he was composing, so that he could refer to it, because he would forget all these ideas. So I have a lot of tapes, and I'm sure that there are kind of, the same way that Mingus plays piano has all those compositions that he improvised into the piano. I have tons of tapes of Charles at the piano. It may very well be, but we just haven't had time to go through them, that there are compositions there. So do you remember that, was that a Jackie Byard orchestration of 
of myself and I'm real. Jackie Barnard, I think, people. did one orchestration when Charles went to Tokyo, and the, the Japanese put out some kind of right. album, Illegal, <laughs> um, with a horrible Japanese, it sounds like a metronome. It's a, a Japanese orchestra and, Charles, and a quartet or a quintet. I think Danny Richmond couldn't go, there was some problem. Charles McPherson had had an, a plane accident and was not flying anymore. And it would have taken him three weeks to go to Japan by a steamship or whatever it was. So he wasn't there. Charles had a pickup quartet that played with this big Japanese orchestra, which had learned every note immaculately that Jackie Byard had written. But it sounded like a machine. But that's the only thing that I remember Jackie, and it was an unfair representation, uh, I mean, uh, um, um, but there, I don't know who, the, what am I thinking of? Oh, Alvin Ailey did a 60-minute piece called Mingus Dances. He was choreographing for the Robert Joffrey Ballet, and we have 60 minutes of that. Now, that was orchestrated by someone else, because normally Charles, he was very slow. And that's why in Epitaph he got uh, uh, some other people to help him, because he well, normally did his own. Melba was one of the main ones, and Jimmy Nipper. Yeah, he, yeah. he got five or six or seven other people, because he was just very I was going to ask you about the, the orchestrating. But this, I can't remember the name of the person that did this, who lived in, um, like Jackie lived in, Ma in Massachusetts, right? Who does Jackie? Jackie. Well, oh, somebody who lived in another uh, arranger orchestrator who did all this, uh, all the pieces for, there were seven yeah. pieces that they orchestrated for a 60 piece band for, for the Alvin Ailey Was dance group. Peggy's Blue Skylight, uh, I forget. Oh. So, Herb Pomeroy did something. Was, Wait, what? Herb Pomeroy did something. Herb did something. No, it wasn't, I would recognize it. Wasn't that Paul Jeffrey? Is it Paul Jeffrey? No, not Paul Jeffrey. He he was in New York, but um, if you said it, I would recognize. But uh, anyway, it wasn't Jack. Not Bob Hammond. Bob Hammond. What? Bob Hammond. No. No, it was maybe a classical orchestra. I mean, it wasn't a jazz. Sue, so, do you know? Do you happen to know before you got to know him? that where he lived all the time. I mean, he, is he one of those who lived in different places in, in New York and... Who? Mingus. Or was he just... Because when I shout out this word, something will be discovered. I mean, what happens, like uh, there's all this music from uh, Gil Evans' uh, Porgy and Bess that was considered to be lost. Well, it was found in one of Miles' houses, like 20 years later. So, well, when he was all evicted, the time, things are found in an attic or a basement in some big trunk, and I'm predicting that, well, <laughs> so that would be great. Well, as I say, there was a trunk full of scraps of, of spores, and then um, yeah. um, when he was evicted, as you see, it was televised by Channel 4, Channel 7, you see the pieces of paper all around on the studio as they're loading yeah. his stuff yeah. in the truck. So I think stuff may have been lost, but I don't know. Besides right. this this composing at the piano, Gunther, I think yeah. there may well be gems yeah. in there. Okay, I think we need to wrap it up. Okay. Like the all right. Just have to go